listen for a word from God from Acts chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. This is the New Revised Standard Version. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and a man lame from birth was being carried in. People would lay him daily at the gate of the temple called Beautiful Gate so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. The Word of God. A beggar asks for help every day, sitting in the same spot, every day. He sits outside the most striking building in the neighborhood, the building that houses the presence of the divine and the people who belong to the divine. Back and forth, the faithful travel, back and forth. They enter at a gate called Beautiful. Isn't that fantastic? The way in, the name of the way in is called Beautiful. The beggar at the gate is a cripple. He's at the bottom of the who's who's list, right? And he'll spend the rest of his life there. The cripple, the blind, the leper, the children, the women, the luck of the draw. Never forget, this is how it works in systems of power. People shape the who's who's list and write these scripts for our world. The crippled man depends on others to carry him to his begging spot each morning and then home in the evening. Take this in. The faithful literally trip over this man to get inside their beautiful temple. I know we're supposed to start at the beginning of the story, Acts chapter 1. That's the proper beginning to this book, this this story of the days of the disciples waiting after the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. They're waiting on God. Jesus goes up. The Spirit comes down. The disciple moves out. This traffic flow is established. That's Acts 1. Yet I'm thoroughly drawn to this story in Acts chapter 3, a day the disciples return to their temple to pray. This is the day we enter our beautiful space for the first time in 57 weeks. If you're watching online, there's also a group of us gathered right here in the sanctuary today, distanced and masked, 57 weeks. This is our pandemic homecoming. The faithful enter their sanctuary in Acts chapter 3, hoping to attract divine attention, and outside lays someone desperately needing the attention of the divine. Acts chapter 3, back to the the text, verse 4 says, When he saw Peter, when the cripple saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he looked at them for alms. Peter looked intently, as did John, and said, Look at us. He fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold. What I have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and he raised him up and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, it's not what you know, it's who you know. They call on the name of Jesus of Nazareth because calling out his name is the best way to make his power authoritative, operational in this moment. In the name of Jesus is as good as having Jesus present. And if this works, the men in the temple, it's as good as saying the mission of Jesus is with these disciples, inherited, embodied in motion. It's a miracle. The the man who never took one step in his life is jumping in church. The book of Acts will continue with scenes like this, these unexplainable interventions by the divine, so much so that we might ask, is this why we do church? And the history of the Christian church will continue with stories of the miraculous and the enthusiastic, these movements focused on healing. In our tradition, Seventh-day Adventist Christianity, our emphasis on the healing arts is based on the renewal and the healing movement in the 19th century of America, largely rooted in these miraculous stories in Scripture. It's true, these stories in Scripture, the disciplines of medicine and magic and spiritual healing, they're not neatly divided. Practitioners, they take advantage, claiming to heal. When Christianity is organized as the official religion in the fourth century, 
Augustine does his best to make it a respectable religion, and he, he cleans up some of the magic and the sorcery and the deceit, masking a spiritual healing. Even though by the medieval ages, the kings of France and England are known to be healers with a royal touch, people lined up to be healed of tuberculosis or one kind of a disease or another that the king could magically cure. Miracles, they've always attracted enthusiastic crowds, even today, right? Maybe you've visited a healing event where the sick line up and they wait for the touch of an anointed servant of God. Many years ago, there was a man who waited right in here Friday night after first service. The college students were having their worship. He waited to talk to a pastor. It turned out I'm the last person in the building. He waited because the Lord gave him a vision. The Lord told him he needed to heal the people of Riverside because Riverside is sick. No comment. The Lord told him to find an Adventist church. The Lord told him to find a pastor who would listen. And when he saw I was the only pastor left, he said, you are the pastor? Oh, yes, because, yes, the Lord told me it would be a, a female pastor with children. That's you, isn't it? It was a long hour with this guy. Short version of the story. Airplanes were secretly dropping poison on the citizens of Riverside, and this man could provide the cure for three small payments of $1,500. If you're ambivalent about healings, maybe it's because there is no shortage of such scams or, or because there are a variety of ways people experience God physically and cognitively. Or maybe you're on the other side asking, why aren't more crippled people jumping in church today? Maybe it's like one commentator who says, well, we live in more humdrum days. Two followers of Jesus decide that what's happening inside the temple will not keep them from stopping outside the temple. The reason they take time to stop outside is because they know their why. They know why they're headed to temple in the first place. To pray? No. To, to pray is what they're going to be doing. To give offering? No. To give offering is what they do. Why is praying on their to-do list? Why are they praying at the temple? Why do they go in pairs together? Why do they pray several times a day? This is only their three o'clock prayer. Why these repetitive rituals? Why does all of this get so much of your devotion, Peter and John? It's, it's like having a three-year-old in the conversation. Why? Two followers of Jesus interrupted their ritual. The, cripple, the crippled man asked for spare change. Peter demanded that he make eye contact, that, that he be seen, that this beggar be seen rather than sit in shame. And then Peter told him, I don't have money. I have the name of Jesus. Get up and walk. The Bible is careful to say Peter gave the man his hand. He looked him in the eye. He touched his skin. The cripple stood. The ankles became strong and he walked. Friends, this story is naming all that we've missed so deeply while physically apart. To look at each other in the eye, to bear witness to one another's lives, to, to touch and to hug and to be seen and be heard, to be encouraged and empowered and energized because, because we've spent time together, to be well because we came here. Peter looked him in the eye, gave him his hand, touched his skin, and the cripple stood. His ankles became strong and he walked. And then a miracle occurred, I say. The man always on the outside walked inside alongside the disciples. That's when the miracle occurred. The man from the outside now walks inside with friends. The contaminated man from out there He's with the supposedly holy, unblemished people of God. Acts 3 verse 8 says, And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaking. He entered with them. This is the miracle that day. The religious people in the temple that day, they don't understand. The religious people question and stare. The formerly crippled man is hanging on, clutching Peter. Look at the text this afternoon. It's a fantastic detail. He's clinging and clutching and hanging on for his life while he's being shouted over and around and about. Acts 3, verse 12. You Israelites, Peter's talking. You Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant Jesus. 
Peter says, he goes on to say that the Jesus that you handed over to Pilate, the Jesus you killed, the one God raised, Peter gets a forceful and preachy, you know, a preachy preacher. Peter gets that way. Verse 16, Peter says, and by faith in his name, Jesus's name, his name alone has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. Why are you astonished? Peter asked. We didn't do this. God did this. God wants people well. It's the central truth of the gospel, the people damaged and the people doing the damage, the people too ashamed to ask to belong and and they ask for spare pocket change instead, and the people who teach them what to ask for. God wants people well, whole, healthy. Everything good about our lives, God did. Everything that needs healing, God will do through Jesus. This is the gospel. This is their why, Peter and John. They know their why. Do we? Why did you miss gathering these 57 weeks? Did the gospel stop because we couldn't meet? No. Did the gospel cease because we couldn't sing together and pray together and, and be in one space at the same time? No, no. Meeting and singing and praying, it's what we do. But the why of the gospel, that's not changed. I'll be the first to admit that doing what we do brings stability and order and confidence and calm to my life. Yes. Yet doing what we do is not the why, the deeper meaning and thinking. Simon Sinek, you know this name maybe from TED Talks or from one of his first books years ago, Start With the Why. Simon says he became obsessed with this idea, the why, the why. And so he started digging into how it is some companies are successful over the long haul. How do they differentiate themselves? Simon admits he's obsessed with Apple, not because he says, in my opinion, they make the best product, but because they lead with the why and then we want to do business with them. We will buy whatever Apple makes in the end. We'd never imagined we'd be purchasing MP3 players from a computer company decades ago, but we do it all the time now. Simon's tagline is this, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So Simon drilled down on how the brain is involved, and I'll say more about this in the upcoming weeks. For now, here's his graph, the why, the how, and the what. Or the what, the how, and the why, because most of us work from the outside in. We know what we do, and we know how we do it, but we give much less thought to the why. We work from the outside in. Um, this applies to most areas of our life, by the way. Think about it for a moment. The Sabbath is coming. We know what we do. Uh, the relatives are coming. The holiday is coming. We know what we do. These are the outside layers. They're the details and the logistics and the data and the language. But the inner circle is where meaning and purpose and belief exist. The inner circle attends to feelings and loyalty and reason. The reasons why we get out of bed in the morning. The reasons why we long to be in our sanctuary. Coming to church is what we do. But why do we do it? When we work from the inside out, dramatically different experiences result. It, and it feels a little bit awkward, it, it will, but it can act like a filter for every decision that we need to make. It removes the guesswork. So here's a small example that Simon uses. You're going to a dinner party and they tell you you need to bring food. And people begin to shout out what you need to take. Get M&Ms. No, bring rice milk. No, get Kit Kat bars. No, we need celery for the party. So you go to the supermarket and you buy all the products. We buy everything. No one can actually see what we value or what we believe. If our why is to be healthy and only allow things that protect our bodies, we buy celery and rice milk. It'll be a little different party, but that's what we buy. And we'd spend less time and money and, and now people can actually see what we value and we can remain authentic to ourselves. We might even attract opportunities because people can see who we are. It's a small example, the power of the why. We're going to talk about this for a few weeks now. What's our cause and our purpose and our belief? Why is it so deeply grieving to have missed church 57 weeks? Because we worshiped God at home. We, we did join our Zoom Sabbath school class and we FaceTimed friends and family and we prayed with people over the phone. Why did we miss church so deeply? 
Friends, we're at this intersection, the church, the body of Christ. Like most businesses and organizations and institutions, like our two campuses, for goodness sakes, Christian education is at an intersection. If you didn't know, hold our two campuses close in prayer. Alumni watching today, our our campus needs our best support now because the pandemic only expedited changes that were already coming. The pandemic now served us an entirely new menu. We're at an intersection. Some things may be the same as when you were a student here. Alumni, if you're watching this morning, here's a little letter uh, pulled from really in between the boards and, and the beams in Gladwin Hall. I call it the Gladwin Letters. Circa 1955, we'll call her Martha, the female student who writes this correspondence and receives correspondence, several letters tucked into one envelope. It seems she has a suitor, and her suitor lives in Fresno, and he writes often. He asks Martha if he can come to campus for a visit, and he does come to campus. They they have a great weekend, and she takes him to the programs and to church, and he goes home, and he continues to write. And uh, and I open another letter, and... And it's from a different suitor. There's not only a suitor in Fresno, there's someone in Las Vegas. And he also wants to campus, come to campus and visit Martha. And he asks, and you can watch Martha's correspondence back and forth between these two young men. Some things haven't changed, right? Some things about student life and young adult life haven't changed. Friends and finances, and food, and sleep, and studies. Some things haven't changed. They're only happening now in a brand new context that isn't even recognizable to the 1950s. We are at this intersection in our campuses, in Christian education, in our denomination, besides every business. We can't wait to get back to church. This has been our anthem for months. But I'd like us to think carefully at this intersection and collectively about the community we want and why. What do we truly want back and what can we thank for its service and release? And what can we create that's urgent and non-negotiable? And what must finally be attended because it's wrong to ignore? It had to be Acts chapter 3 today, friends, as we begin gathering again in our sanctuary, as we come to the temple Peter and John going to the temple. Peter and John who know their why. Their why is the gospel. That's what caused them to pause outside. If our why is not the gospel, we better pause a little longer. And if our why can't address a young man, Dante Wright, in a community in Minnesota, if our why doesn't doesn't actually address Afghanistan and Washington, D.C., if our why disregards a glacier in Alaska, Denali, moving at 100 times the rate it normally does. If our why isn't attentive to our world, we ought to pause a little longer because it's the gospel. It's the gospel that caused Peter and John to pause outside their temple. They allow their lives to become really the stage on which Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, appears. This is what they allow. The life of Jesus, it's inseparably bound to the life of his disciples. If nothing separates us from the love of God, then nothing separates us from the life of Jesus. A year of sheltering at home does not quarantine the gospel. May we use this intersection as we make our way back to our sanctuary or whatever faith community you are part of. As we make our way back to our campuses this fall, we, may we use this intersection wisely. The why has not changed. We can say it dozens of ways. Loving God in front of people, loving people in front of God. For God so loved the world, Jesus saves. We can say it many ways. The gospel remains. And our lives are the stage on which the resurrected Jesus appears and claims each creature as God's own. That's our why. Amen.